All righty, and we're on. So I'm here cool. with uh, now. So I, I obviously most people call you Sol, right? But your full name is Salasi. How do I? Is that is that how I pronounce it? Yeah, that's how you say it, Salasi. Yeah. Yes, Salasi Verdi. And um, the, the interesting story about how I I got in contact with you was I was buying some protein powder, and yep. you've got obviously a, a, a protein powder brand as one of the things that you do. And um, I reached out via the the website. And all I was at, at the time, you only had like the small, the smaller, you know, 900 gram, one kilo style bottles. And I, yeah. I sent a message just saying, hey, you know, is there any um, discount for buying multiples? Um, you know, just that no, doesn't hurt to ask, right? And yeah, um, of course, I, I was uh, a bit surprised when you know you were the man that came back and responded to me and said, oh yeah, you know, thanks for the support, brother, and really appreciate it. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, <laughs> And since then, you know, I, I know you've you've got the bigger ones, and I've 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 got my big uh, my big oh, awesome, one there. Um, but you know, uh, I, I, yeah, and I, so at the time, I actually reached out and said, "Dear, hey, you know, uh, I, I do a podcast and would love to have you on for a chat." And and that was I think it was back in August of 2020, so last year. Yep. And uh, it's been a long time coming, uh, but we're finally here. <laughs> nah, man, I'm glad, stoked to be here. That's good. So I, I guess, you know, like most people would probably describe you as a, as a guy who, you know, some people say you're a serial entrepreneur because you, you, you do have multiple businesses. But I guess I'm sort of curious, how, how would you describe yourself? Like what, what do you think is the right description for you? Oh, man, I think um, probably, probably the way I think of myself is someone that likes to have a crack of things. Um, some, some people refer that to being an entrepreneur. I, I just kind of view it as someone that likes to, to try his hand at different things. I figure if you don't do things, you'll never know what you don't like. I've worked out over the years in multiple different businesses, things that I really do love and things that I don't love. Um, and on the full 360s, you know, that, that I really enjoy delivering products to people. Um, mm. I get the most satisfaction and enjoy out of that. But I think it's also just the aspect of um, really pushing the boundaries in anything that you do. And I find um, there to be a lot of, um, a lot of real self-satisfaction in, in being able to build something from the ground up. So I think that's probably led me to go down the business, some call it entrepreneurial path that um, I yep. ended up going down. Okay. So I guess, you know, where I always like to start is uh, I, want, I want to sort of bring it back. Um, you know, uh, where, where did you grow up? And I guess, what would your earliest memory um, that you can think of be? Yeah, man, I, I grew up in, um, I was born in Melbourne, fortunately. My um, parents were first, um, first generation immigrants that moved there to get on a scholarship, an engineering scholarship in Melbourne University. One of like, one of a million basically kids. So he was um, a little village um called um tema and basically from there we were he moved there when he was 35 and then i was born about a year year after that and my earliest childhood um memories are just great i think i had a really really great upbringing um with my parents they were they were loving they were caring we didn't have um we were we were in um i guess commission housing is, is probably the term for it, but I never went without food. Um, I was always really well looked after by um, different people that were not immediate family, but they felt like family to me. So um, yeah. I was just stoked. Um, so I remember living there till I was about four, four or five. Um, then we moved to Papua New Guinea. Um, my dad finished his PhD at Melbourne Uni and the best playing places you could get were in very dangerous areas of the world. And Papua New Guinea was pretty much the most dangerous area in the world. Um, it probably still is, to be honest. I haven't been back for, for a fair while. And so he was a uni lecturer there, lived on campus at the uni. Um, big, big, like, towering fences of barbed wire. Um, wow. it, it doesn't get much publicity of all the craziness that happens there, but I've been to mm. a lot of a lot of places around the world and that's definitely the most dangerous place I lived. So um, be back in your 
community by six o'clock, curfews, if you're outside of that gated community, any time after that, your life is is on the line. Um, mm. Dad got held up at gunpoint a few times. Mum got um, knife put to her a couple of times. Like it's no, it's no joke. So I was there, we were there till I was about 10. Um, mm -hmm. And it was good for my dad because it gave him a really good grounding and footing to be able to um, move back to Australia um, and basically start engineering businesses from there. And um, from there, he just, um, he really killed it. I was always into sports from a young age. Um, it started off in soccer, then went to tennis. Um, and then I was going down the full tennis path of wanting to be a professional tennis player. And then one um, kind of off-season in tennis, one of my mates said, come and play footy. I'm going to play rugby league um, that weekend. Some guys said I was really good, but I played for the high school team in a competition called the Confraternity Shield. That Confraternity Shield, by chance, Arthur Beeson, who's a legend in the rugby league world, happened to be there and said that I want a scholarship for the Roosters. And then I basically stop playing tennis and then just went straight down the path of rugby league for uh, the better part of the next 10 years of my life. Yeah. Um, but whilst doing that, I was um, still going to uni to do exercise science and nutrition and marketing. And then um, within that also started um, working in different areas. First company I worked for was a sports nutrition company called Body Science, mm -hmm. um, which is where I probably got my biggest understanding of health, nutrition, and everything that goes into it, which therefore led me into uh, a lot of the things that I do now. So that gave me a really good grounding and footing there. Yeah. Well, okay, there's a lot to unpack there. So I guess, you know, um, so your father, when he, when he did his PhD in engineering, did you say? Yeah, yeah, he, um, he was a geotechnical engineer, or still is. Um, he semi-retired, but yeah, he's a geotechnical engineer. Okay. And so then, um, you know, at the age of four, having to move over to Papua New Guinea, did you actually, like, did they say, hey, you know, so we're going to move overseas and this is where we're going to go? Did you did you have any sort of awareness over that? Or was it, for, for you as a kid, was it just like, okay, um, you're suddenly in this new place? Like, do you remember, you know, how you felt about it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like a move like that, no matter how young you are, even though I was four or five, um, it sticks with you definitely remember um the feeling of anxiousness and you're going from melbourne um the cultural epicenter of um australia there's a city and even mm. though you're young you still, you still get the vibe of it um we lived in fitzroy and carlton so in a city yeah. suburb right, um, in the heart. right in the heart to landing in a very tribal regional um almost like um, primal place you can instantly instantly feel it you, you feel that energy and emotion when you're a kid um, but at the same time I, I absolutely loved it when I was um, when I was there as a kid um, to be honest it, 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 you, you learn a lot and it's probably the best years to do something like that um, mm. aspect of you learn a, an appreciation of those that are around you um, you you become very street smart street savvy at a young age, you know that um, life can be precious and you need to look after those around you and yourself. Um, and you also learn a lot about um, just cultural differences, but yep. what makes um, those people amazingly unique and beautiful in themselves as well. Um, how they, like things like rugby league, are just, they're so passionate about stuff like that and so passionate about a lot of different things within their culture that is um, also really cool. Mm. Okay, and so your your fam so you, your parents are first generation migrants. Where were they? Where did they grow up? They grew up in Ghana, um, so in West Ghana. Africa. Yeah, West Africa. yeah. So yeah. yeah, they were born there. Um, their their parents were born there. They um, they were the first people effectively to leave Ghana. Um, my right. dad was. My mum followed closely after. Yep. yep. Yeah. And have you ever have you ever have you ever been back there? 
Yeah, yeah, being back there. Um, I was, um, I had a rule of going back every five years, basically. So um, last year was supposed to be my seventh time going. So basically I'm 35 now. I go back every yeah. five years. When I was between 18 to like 25, I was going almost every two or three years. But then obviously what's happened with COVID last year got knocked out. But um, yep. plan, plan on being back there next year for sure. Okay. And so I guess over those, all those different years that you've been back there, have you noticed a, a change in what, what life is like in, in Ghana now? Or is it still very similar to what it was like when you were going you know, as you were younger? Um. Ghana Ghana's a unique African um, country in the aspect of there is no heavy violence or political unrest. Um, mm -hmm. It's very it's third world. There's no there's no doubt about that. But um, because of its safety, um, it's quite it's quite easy to live per se. Mm -hmm. Like there's I'm sure there's a lot of poverty and everything like that. But there isn't like this like crazy building of infrastructure and stuff like that that's happening so there isn't huge progression but with with that being said i think um the things that have definitely continually improve everywhere is technology and mm -hmm. that technology connects people to a wider world so they're obviously very aware of everything that's going on um in the world around them um mm -hmm. prior to there being i think um COVID and because I've been since there was a lot of people coming in and out because it's quite easy to get to from places like London which is where most people um UK most people from Ghana end up if they're going mm. on for professions and stuff so those people would bring in a lot of um different wealth different characteristics and so it become like quite a cool melting pot of um mm -hmm. di different cultures different aspects which was which was cool to see yeah and was, did the family have a lot of pride and obviously your dad, you know, getting out to Australia and, and studying a PhD and all that? Was there, was there any sort of, you know, pride around that? Yeah, I mean, I think probably I'm his biggest fan um, in terms of the pride I, as a dad now myself, I just know how hard that would have been. Like um, mm. being, being 35, never being out of Ghana, arriving in Australia, starting a phd in melbourne washing dishes driving cabs um with the wife and a kid and basically going 24 7 to build a better life to be the first to to be the pioneer to start something makes um what i've done seem like nothing to be honest yeah. like he the, the leg up that he gave me is um something that as i get older every year i get older i realize how how much of a an absolute machine um, that he is. But I think it's hard for people to grasp in Ghana what he has done because mm. they also haven't been here. So there's probably yeah. a level of, they know he's done well, but um, until you actually see what he's actually done, it's hard yeah. to really, really understand really it. Really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I always, I always say because yeah, my parents migrated to Australia as well. So I always like to say that you know when, when it comes to my parents, it's like they they've given me this opportunity that I stand on their shoulders. You know, like that old saying about standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Yeah. Um, when when I was growing up, you know, my parents ran their own businesses. Uh, my dad is an accountant, uh, still is an accountant today. Yeah. Uh, at the time, my mum had a computer shop, and then she later moved into real estate, and she had her own real estate yeah. business, and. Uh, you know, when you when you're young, you you don't really, you know. I never really thought about it. To me, life was normal. You know that we'd eat at like nine thirty yeah. at night. You know, we'd eat dinner so late because they were at work. And by the time yeah. we get home, it was always late. You know, my brother and I would always you know sleep in the car because you know yeah. it's late. And yeah. um, you know, but I, I started to I really started to appreciate it again. You know, when I had kids as well. Yeah. Uh, because what you sort of see is how much sacrifice that they yeah. put into it for the family. Yeah. And, you know, it, and I, I, I think, you know, I, I'm in a fortunate position where I can have a slightly different relationship with my kids as a result, you know, because yeah. of the sacrifices that my parents made, I can have a closer relationship to my kids that my parents probably didn't have the time for with, with me. Sure. Um, yeah. I don't know if, if you feel that same way as well, but, you know, that's just sort of yeah. how I, I feel about it. No, I definitely, I definitely feel like that with my dad. Um, like, 
there was rarely a sporting event that he would see me in. Um, I could tell he was always proud um, with all the accomplishments and everything like that, but he, he didn't have the opportunity to even see any of them. Mm. And at the time, I knew how hard he was working and everything like that, and other parents would be there. My mum um, was very much the person that would try and be there for a lot of the things, even though she was working 24-7 as well. Um, yeah. At the time, you don't think much of it, but now looking back at it, you can... I can definitely see even with my kids, um, mm. him being their granddad, how much he gets there for even their stuff that he couldn't have yep. got there for mine. I see how much joy that brings him. So mm. I feel like he's almost catching up on a lot of the time, of time. That, he, that he missed and the sacrifices he made. So that does give me a level of, um, a great level of joy um, to see to see that come come full circle but as you did say as well the fact that um I wake up I go train but I come home and I'm able to take my kids to school um I actually can't remember when he ever was able to take me to school he was already well well on the way with work and although I'm working extremely hard um the work still kind of is on my time like I can still adjust yeah. things to take my kids to school, I can still pick them up, I can drop them home, I can go back to work, I'm talking to you yeah. now. Um, in the morning, I can do the same thing where I feel um, extremely fortunate to, yeah. to even have that opportunity. Yeah, I think we, we're, we, we're fortunate to be able to value different things because of the sacrifices that they made, you know? For sure. Um, and I, look, I do want to talk more about kids, but I, I guess we'll, we'll come to that a bit later. I, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was so going to Papua New Guinea, uh, you would have done your primary schooling there for at least a few years then, right? Yep. Can, yep. What, what, what was that like? Was, I guess what was your schooling experience there like? Yeah, so I went to an international school. So the international school was virtually basically every expat um, in one school. So Americans, Canadians, Australians, some Papua New Guinea kids. Like it was very, a very mixed mixed bag um of people there it was it was a really cool really cool experience um to go to school there it was also very much a case of a very cutthroat experience from a young age um be it um one year in Papua New Guinea so things were just partial full stop like I think um how teaching may be delivered in Australia, it's very different to our teachings delivered there. Um, but at the same time, I think it kind of um, made you super resilient at a, at a, at a really young age um, where you had to be super disciplined and strict with everything because the way it effectively operated was you couldn't even drop kids to school. Like it kind of almost was like, you get picked up from one certain area in a bus in your compound. You had to be there at that time. If you weren't there within that that time, you miss school. And if you miss mm -hmm. school, well, there's the other repercussions for that. But so you had to make sure you were there no matter what, because the fact was you actually couldn't really get your parents to drop you at school because it was too dangerous, effectively. Like they had a kind of almost a system of like power and numbers. So buses would leave together like almost in a convoy line. Mm. So that would ensure people would get to where they need to safety. If you missed it, you're better off not going to school because yeah. driving driving individually on the road in certain times, not, not the smartest move. So it kind of gives you like a landscape of like, how you get to school, how you get off the bus at school, what you would do um, in terms of like, even at a super young age at primary school, like your responsibilities of ringing the bell at a certain time if it wasn't done by a certain time um that was like literally climbing ladders to ring these bells um to to start the school so you had to be like on a military watch and you're doing this from i was doing that from grade two um type of thing and yeah. my son's about to be in grade two next year there's no way he could do <laughs> he would even be in that in that frame of mind of even really being on a clock and all that type of stuff. So it felt a bit like boarding school um, from a young age, even though it mm. really wasn't. But I feel that um, that really set me up for um, later points in life where I feel 
that stuff really helped me prepare for the rest yeah. of gave me a good foundation. Yeah. Yeah, that, that discipline piece. Um, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, my, my mum was pretty strict uh, when I was a kid, right? And so uh, as an Asian son, you know, I, I had all these extracurricular activities, whether it was, you know, Chinese language classes on the weekend, yeah. you know, piano, tutoring, all of those sorts of yeah. things. And, yeah. and you know, my mum my pushed me really hard when I, when I was young. And, you know, in, in hindsight, I'm actually so grateful for it because yeah. um, once I hit high school, like I, I sort of went into that rebellious sort of phase where I, I didn't really um, care as much in the sense, you know, it's more about, you know, I wanted to play games with my friends and, and do all that. I wasn't really um, thinking about all that sort of stuff, but I went to a, a, a good high school as well. And when I got to the, the senior years in high school, you know, it's sort of that, that sort of pushing when I was young, just when I reflected on that, I realized that, you know, I can do anything. Well, the only sure. thing is you just got to not have a choice. Like when you're, when you're young, you go wherever your parents tell you to go. You do yeah. whatever they tell you to do. And, you know, I realized that, hey, you know, I used to do all of these things outside of school, plus my schoolwork. I did pretty well at it. So, you know, the only, the only difference was that I didn't give myself a choice. And yeah. that, that sort of um, mindset, I think, has been what has helped me throughout my career in my life is that, you know, when you remove the option, you know, um, you know, my wife and I were talking about this um, earlier tonight where I have a very addictive personality, right? So yeah. when I do things, I, I, I go deep. Like, you know, if I, if I get suckered into playing a video game, it's bad because I'm yeah. really into that video game. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think, you know, for about a week and a half, I, was, uh, I got back into some video games and, I, and then, you know, the other, I think it was on Friday, I, I came back and, um, from training. And I'm like, I've got to delete these games. Like, they're gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, it, it's starting to, to have an impact on everything else that I do. So, you know, that, that moment, I, I uninstalled them and I don't touch them ever again. <laughs> like, nice. until the next one. But, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, I think, you know, those, those, those sorts of experiences when you're young, they really do have that sort of um, formative impact in, in terms of your outlook and, and how you approach things later yeah. on. Um, how, how would you describe yourself as a kid in school? Like, what, what kind of kid were you? And I was, um, I was, I was competitive. I've always, I've always had a competitive streak in me. So I hated losing. Um, it took me a while to get, become a better, not a sore loser. Um, mm. I think that I was probably grade four, grade five before I, I started realizing if I'm going to lose my shit every time I lose, it's going to be a, it's going to be a rough life. So, um, I was always competitive. I always wanted to do my best. Um, someone like yourself could probably attest to it. Where if you're from, if you come from first world immigrants um, that have, have like parked in Australia, there is no second. Like you, you have to be get great grades um, first and foremost. Is always a thing. Similar to you, yeah. I'd be tutoring. Have to go to tutoring and lots of that type of stuff. Sport would be secondary, but if you're going to do sport, make sure you give your best. Um, so I think I was always a kid that was um, really, really pushing his best um, and had a lot of energy and really good friends because um, I'm an only child. I think um, maybe naturally that made me gravitate towards um, people that almost became like my brothers. Like they were my mm. sort of my friends as my brothers and people I went to literally school with in Papua New Guinea um, from like grade one, I'm still friends with today. Um, yeah. And then people I went to grade three and grade four with were my best men at my wedding. So um, yeah. I think there was something about um, knowing that I was an only child that made me have really strong bonds with um, friends. Um, yeah. And I really, um, I really cherish those those moments and those friends and still having them like I don't I definitely don't take that for granted so um, I think that kind of was my big things within school of like just wanting to have a really tight group of people um, mm. around me at times being really competitive within sports within school um, and just yeah having having a really really good go at everything yeah yeah like I think you know to, to hear that that you've remained in contact you've done you've done really well like to have friends from a that were in a different you met in a different country that you're yeah. still you know uh, good with today 
you know, I, I've, I've, you know, my, my, I guess in terms of primary school friends, like I've probably only got a handful that I still probably talk to today. Um, yep. But, you know, am I that close compared to, you know, other friends that are at different stages in life? Probably not, you know? Yep. Um, and I think, you know, one of those things is like, it's, you know, kids is always that equalizer, right? Like I, I think whenever you have kids, you instantly become five years older than any of your friends that don't have kids. Yep. You know, For and sure. it's not an intentional thing. It's just that your, yeah. your priorities and your focuses become different. Um, yeah. And then, you know, when your friends then catch up and have kids, then they it's like a, a light bulb moment. They go, oh, yeah. okay, we now understand what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, sure, it's definitely yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when you came back to Australia then, uh, did yeah. you guys go, come, you came back to Melbourne or did you come back to a different, uh, a different city? No, we actually ended up in North Queensland because with um, geotechnical engineering, the mining boom had started yeah. then. So yeah. uh, we got based in Mackay from, yep. uh, would have been 10, 10 years old yep. in Mackay, North Queensland. Um, but within that period of time, I ended up back in Melbourne um, when I was 12, 13, living by myself or living with friends, a friend's family on a tennis scholarship whilst I was down there yeah. so my parents met in Mackay and I, I moved down to Melbourne for like a year but then I yeah. ended up moving back to Mackay um just simply because the tennis was great and everything like that but there was also an aspect of after a year I think my parents and probably my, I myself realized that as much as I wanted to make it in tennis and advance myself I was going to miss out on like some of the most important years of not having parents guidance like i was doing yeah. i was doing my best best with it like i was self-sufficient i could cook i would get myself to school i'd do all those types of things there wasn't an issue with that but at the same time a 13 year old still needs um parental advice <laughs> like yeah. I, I was i was good of not like just running off the rails or anything like that but it was still the aspect we were like look it's great that we've got this far with tennis but let's come back to Mackay finish high school um, in North Queensland, keep doing tennis as far as I can. And then almost um, during the holidays of each year, um, go back to Melbourne with the same coaches to keep trying to advance the skills. Yeah, wow. Okay, so a couple of things I wanna sort of debrief on there. So uh, obviously when you were coming back to Australia and then going to, I guess the first stop being Mackay, your parents would have had that conversation with you said, hey, we're moving back to Australia. This is where we're yep. going to go. Um, how did you feel about it? Obviously, you'd started to, you'd, you'd had established friends in Papua New Guinea yeah. by that stage. Um, was, was that a bit of a challenge for you or, you know, yeah. were you excited to come back? No, I was super upset. I remember, yeah. I remember being um, really upset. I remember two emotions. I remember the emotion of going, this is the best thing that could happen for my family because mm. we're moving out of clear danger. Like we're mm. like every, every day that waking up of anxiousness and worry and fear or wondering whether your dad was going to come home or mum was going to come home was going to be removed effectively by moving back mm. to Australia. So there was like two mixed emotions of real happiness that the family could move away from that, but also real sadness that, um the bonds um that i've made with people over there like anything i think you bond a lot more with people when things are hard and things weren't yeah. easy there so even though you're at a young age you the friends that you make when things are a bit more challenging are probably closer friends hence why i still yeah. keep in touch with some of them um from there so i was definitely sad and upset that i was gonna not have those people in my direct and immediate life but um, at the same time, yeah, it, it was a it was a mixed bag of emotions. Yeah, moving yeah. back. Yeah. So then, um, when you came back, how did the tennis scholarship come about? So was was that through school or was that through people that you knew previously? Obviously, you know when well you would have only been four when you left, so couldn't have been yeah. that. <laughs> nah, nah, it was um. So people I did know still in Melbourne, um, obviously were, um still playing tennis and still doing things from when I left. When I got back to Mackay um, every, like maybe once a year or um, every six months type of thing, we'd go back to Melbourne to see the people we obviously knew in Melbourne. And then I started playing tennis at different courts when I was there 
continue to yeah. hit. And then um, one of my mum's really good friends, Gail, was like, he's like really good. Like he's, for someone that hasn't been coached, because I hadn't been coached in Papua New Guinea, I just kept playing um, type yeah. of thing, that if he had proper coaching, he could go anywhere with it. So my mum, she got me linked up with a coach there. Um, and then he basically played with me for like that week and then said, look, I think you're probably good enough um, to qualify for a scholarship within one of these private schools um, within Melbourne. The school is Xavier College um, in Kew. And so he said, play, play the circuit um, in Melbourne and back in North Queensland and a few things. I won some state championships and likes of that. And then basically qualified to be able to get a scholarship to that school. So once I got the scholarship, then I moved um, back down there. Yeah. And I guess, how was that experience for you? Did you, did you have some mixed emotions about it? Obviously, because you're going to be away from your parents, but then was there yeah. any excitement as well, you know, that you're gaining independence at such a, such a young age? Yeah. Yeah, there was. Um, there, it was twofold. It was like, I, I felt almost like a similar thing. Like when I left Papua New Guinea in the aspect of we moved back to, we had moved to Mackay. I started making really good friends there. I'd been there for, three years on three to four years by this stage and then um this opportunity i knew is something that as a kid you think living in the city by yourself what an amazing opportunity um mm. and obviously wanting to be a professional sports person i thought this is the quickest way i can possibly get there but then at the same time leaving your parents and leaving what you know there also seems a bit daunting but I've always been, even from that age, always thought, unless I do it, I'll never know. Like, yeah. I, I would be sitting here with you today in the back of my head thinking, if I didn't give that a try, what could have been? Um, mm. So I hate I hate that feeling of having any type of regret. So yeah. um, I would rather do it knowing that it didn't work out than not do it at all. So, yeah, yeah I, I was just kind of like, let's just go all in and see see where we end up with it. Yep. And were your parents on the same, like in the same mindset or were they a bit apprehensive about letting you go by yourself? I think they were in the same mindset. I think they also yep. knew that um, they'd worked extremely hard to even have this opportunity present themselves, that they would probably live with a level of regret if a tennis scholarship was offered, I didn't take it, and then never got to see what the end result would have been yeah mm. so i feel they thought the exact same thing that obviously they're not going to miss me i'm an only child um and everything like that but they also thought it was better to give it a try than not to give it a try at all yeah so i guess you know when you when you went down there at, at that age and finding some independence um what were some of the learnings that you you took away from that experience man i think um i think the learnings i took away my biggest learning that I took away was there was probably no substitute for having really good friends um, in your corner because I basically picked up and left the friends that I knew there um, that I had and I built a great bond with and moved to this other place. And um, sure, I met a lot of people, but the, the aspect of having people in your corner is just so, so important. Like it's... Um, I don't think people, I think a lot of people take for granted how important good friends are um, in your life. Like you think of a friend and then you think I should connect with them and all these different types of stuff, but they kind of, um, particularly at a young age, form who you become. Um, and I and I lost that to a certain extent. So mm. whilst I was playing good tennis and doing all these good things, I definitely felt like, without having those people that were um, very much a massive part of my life, I realised that I was missing out on quite a lot um, mm. with them. So that, that definitely formed one thing. Um, second thing I think it definitely showed me was that having to be able to fend for yourself from a young age is a really important thing because it teaches you life skills that some people never actually even get to learn because they're, they've been coddled and carried 
their whole existence that they turn into adults, but they're still kind of kids because mm. someone had effectively looked after them their whole time. So even though they may be 18 and they may have a license and they have the ability to live out of home or they may even live out of home, they don't actually have the life skills of um, being able to really look after themselves or really look after anyone else um, for that matter. So I yeah. feel that was a great, great opportunity to learn how to do that, but also a great opportunity to learn to be comfortable with myself. So I think it, it taught me that I'm by myself in this huge city, um, but I'm completely also fine with that. Like I don't, um, I don't have all these people that I know or anything like that. So I'm going to have to kind of be comfortable um, being in my, listening to my own thoughts, being comfortable with my own time, which I feel is a great thing because um, right now I, I enjoy my own time. I also enjoy my time with other people, but some people hate time with themselves. So mm -hmm. they, they always have to be around other people, which um, gives them very little time to decipher their own thoughts. So yeah. I think um, I learned I learn a lot in that space about self-reflection yeah. and awareness from a young age. Yeah, I think that's really important. It's one of those things that a lot of people don't do any reflecting. You know, no. they just they live life and they they go through it and they don't, then they wonder, you know, why do these things happen to me? You know, without yeah. taking any sort of accountability or complicity in 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 their actions. You know, like that. It, it may not be your fault that something has happened, but you you have you've had some level of complicity in the outcome. You know that you yeah. you, you haven't done perhaps you haven't done everything that you're supposed to do, and that's why you've ended up in that particular outcome. And I think the other thing that sort of speaks to me from that is, you know, people who um, can't stay out of a relationship, you know, that they jump from relationship to relationship to relationship, yeah. thinking that that's going to find, help them find the answer when perhaps the answer is actually spending some time with themselves to work out what, what they really want, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that was something that was important to me. You know, uh, I was in and out of relationships um, for a, a, a large period of my, you know, teen, late teens and early twenties. And then, yep. you know, um, I, I took a break from all that um, for a while and just, you know, was, got comfortable with the idea that maybe I won't find the right person. And yep. then, you know, the person that I, that I ended up with was somebody that would have been around in my life for the whole time, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, just cool. wasn't, um, you know, uh, the, I, I always, you know, tell this story that, you know, I went to her formal, but not with her. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, well. so <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> All right, so um, let's let's talk a little bit about high school. Um, I guess as a student in high school, you know, how would you describe yourself? So you know, you, you're obviously quite an academic guy because you know you, you're pushed by your parents as well, and academics yeah. was, was a key focus. But I guess from a, a personality perspective, you know, you, you talked about the in independence, you talked about being able to self reflect. Did you feel did that sort of alienate you with some of your peers? Because I want always, I always feel like sometimes. You know, if you have this level of maturity, or you're going, you've gone through something that has forced you to grow up a little bit. Yeah. You feel a bit. It's almost like a dislocation. Like, and I felt like yeah. that. You know, in in my last years of high school, um, because my parents were going through a difficult time. I had some family problems, right? And yeah. and and you know, it's not to say that other people didn't have family problems. You know, yeah. it's, it's just to say that that forced me to really um, withdraw into myself. Yep. And so as a result of that, you know, I sort of disconnected, not disconnected, but probably, you know, just fell out of sync with some of my friends. Yeah. Did, did you have any of that sort of experience? Um, high school was, it was different. It was definitely uh, lots of good, lots of um, different experiences there where um, Mackay, which is where I ended up going back, obviously, to complete high school, was very it was a very strange um, type of, it's a central Queensland town. Um, so it's not super rural, but it's at the same time, by no means a large city in any aspect. And there's very much a case of, there was um, people that had money, people didn't have money. And there was almost like a section of, you should fit into one of these boxes, whichever one that should be. And I was a black guy. Um, most black guys in, in Mackay would either be Aboriginal, Indigenous or Torres Strait Islanders. Um, so often wouldn't come from much money. Um, so 
I was cool with everyone, but I, from my skin complexion, would be identified as a black guy. So I was going to a private school. I was one of two black guys that probably went to a private school. So there was always this like weird, like um, stereotype or thought process that why are you going to school there? You should be going to this public school, Pioneer, or the schools where all these guys would go. Um, why are you playing tennis? You should be playing rugby league, even though I ended up playing rugby league, but at the time I wasn't. Um, and why are you seeing that chick or going out with that chick? You should be going out with this chick. And so at this stage, like it was very much like a line drawn in the sand for high school of what you should and shouldn't do, just based on color, um, sociograph, income of what your parents may have and all these different types of stuff. So I um, I tried not to buy into that. I was just trying to be who I was. Um, like I had struggles. My parents had now started to do well, which I, which was great. So they wanted to send me to a good school. By them doing that led to other people looking down on that, which is a strange thing, but that's that's what high school is. Like there's all, all different mm. types of- um, Insecurities. Yeah, exactly, insecurities with that. Um, I tried not to let any of that really play into factor with me, but it did often end up coming out in different scenarios that could could occur. I was just super fortunate that I had some really good friends that um, regardless of situation or anything would always um, defend me and also call me out when I was being um, maybe being a dickhead or an idiot. So I think that that leads back to that other thing that I think um, I had a good circle of friends that sometimes I could end up getting not out of control by any means, but um, like aggressive or angry or whatever about the situation, they would pull me into line and say, look, like, what are you even concerned about that shit anyway? It doesn't really matter. Like yeah. you're doing you, they do them. Like there's, there's nothing to it, which was always good to pull me, pull me back into line. I think that really did help me because I could easily see how the, the thought process of those guys are drinking alcohol, doing drugs, doing these different types of things. And you're supposed to be like that. So you should do it to fit in with those guys would have easily pulled you down a pretty shit path. Um, whereas, um, I had really good friends that kept me going down a really good path. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I feel I feel very lucky in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's the old adage, you know, misery loves company, right? Yeah. And so yeah. it and it's really easy to get stuck in that mindset where um, you know the circle of influence, circle of concern. You know, if you yeah. if you can only influence this much, why are you caring about all these other things that aren't yeah. within your control? You know, because yeah. all that leads to is, is anxiety or frustration and worry, and that's how those things sort of play out. And yeah. you know, it goes. And I think that that goes back to the whole, you know, what I was saying before about the um, how you complicit in the outcomes that you're receiving. You know, if you're if you're going to concern yourself with those sorts of things, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna drag you back down into um, you know into the dumps where you don't want to be. And yeah. if you just keep focusing on on you and the things that you need to do, then theoretically, you know, the the outcomes. Are, are going to be more positive. Yeah. So, okay. Definitely. So then, um, so the playing playing league did that come up in in high school? Was that yeah. something that you started? Yeah. yeah so you started transitioning high, high school. High school. Yeah. Yep. And um, yeah. was that was that just for your friends group, or was that like a teacher had said, "Hey, you should come and try this"? Or no, it, yeah, it was through the friends group. It was literally um, there was a high school tournament coming up. They realised that they could use some extra numbers. There was no expectation. Um, I was originally saying, no, I've got this tennis tournament for whatever reason. I couldn't do that tennis tournament at that period. So I said, okay, I'll hop in um, and run around with you guys. Um, and then, yeah, I just went from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. At the end of high school, like, was did you have any idea what you wanted to do after high school? Yeah, I, I, I knew, obviously, 100% I knew I wanted to do something in sport. That was that was always going to be there. And so I had a scholarship to the Roosters um, at the end of high school, 
which was really cool because I was going to get paid to go to Sydney to play footy and these different types of things. But my parents, um, rightfully so, um, said, we'll support you and believe in you, whatever you want to do, but you can't go and do something just in sport. You need to have some type of backing, be it degree, be it whatever it may be. So if you choose to take the scholarship, wherever you choose, you need to have a degree linked to it. So mm. my natural thought process was if I need to do a degree, I need to do something in sport. Um, so exercise science was kind of the thing that I literally looked at the sheet of all the different uni degrees that you could do. And I was like, well, I did well. I'm good at science. I did well at science and I love exercising. I always pick, combine those two and let's just do that. So did that. Um, unfortunately for that degree in Sydney, I couldn't get the OP mark. I think it was like an OP four that I needed. And I think I got an OP six, um, at that stage to get into that degree. So I had to tell the roosters, look, I still want to do this scholarship, but I need to be going to uni wherever that is. And so at the time, the Tweed Seagulls was a feeder club for the roosters. So they said, yep, that's all good. You can go to our feeder club that's on the Gold Coast and then do your degree there. So moved to the Gold Coast straight after school. They said the first um, three months of each year, come down the train um, and then go back and do your uni there. So that's basically how I ended up on the Gold Coast um, straight out of school and been here since effectively. Um, yeah. So what, what would your uh, routine be like at that period of your life? So, you know, how, how much how much training was there? How much uni work was there? Yeah. Oh, man, that was, like, people say I have it hard now with work, but that was by far the hardest, yeah. hardest period doing. So I was studying, um, depending on the timetable, it could be lectures of the morning, then a break. I'd go to training, do the training, come back, finish the lectures, and then I would go usually deliver pizzas at night because it was the one thing that I could do after hours at that stage because there wasn't things like uber or anything like back then yeah. so i couldn't not do the two training sessions a day but i also couldn't not do the uni so mm. that um people like why don't you just do a normal job there was no hours no one's giving you a nine to five job when you can only say hey i can only be there between one and three and four and five or something like that so um I would do like that all day, like uni, footy, uni, footy during the day. Then by night, usually like seven, eight o'clock, would do the pizza run shift from say seven till 12 or one. Um, mm. Clean down, wake back up, and then just do it again. So it was um, uni, and that period was, was brutal. It was, um, yeah. yeah, tiring, but rewarding to to eventually get to the end of it yeah yeah I, I have a very similar story so you know when i um i think it was in, at the end of my oh four so that would have been the end of my second year at uni i yeah. i looked in the local paper and i found this apprenticeship job at the local toyota dealership and i was yeah. studying full-time uni uh studying engineering law at uts yeah. and um, I applied for this job and I said, look, you know, uh, I, wa I, I wanted to get into the automotive industry because I thought, you know, with that sort of degree that I was doing, I only really had two pathways. It was either to move into the automotive industry or to move into like civil and construction. Yeah. And, um, you know, I remember going to going to the dealership with my resume in my hand, you know, dropped it off to the receptionist and Cammy was her name. And I said, oh, Cammy, look, I'm not sure if your boss is interested, but I'm, I'm studying at uni at the moment as well. Um, so, but I'd like to do an apprenticeship, but I don't know, you know, what the requirements are going to be and didn't hear anything for maybe four weeks or something. And then, then he actually called me the owner of the business coffee. And the yeah. first question was, you know, Johnny, why do you want to be a mechanic? You're studying engineering and law. Why don't you just finish your degree and go, go and do that? Um, yeah. and I, I needed, I needed to obviously make some money because, you know, my, my family situation was a little bit, um, off from that perspective. So I didn't have the, the support that I needed from, from that perspective. So I had to find that independence. But um, I guess, you know, what I learned from doing that experience, so I was, you know, working practically a full-time week. So, you know, yeah. I used my 38 hours. I, I did get some leeway to go to uni for, for certain subjects and bits and pieces. So I was really yeah. grateful for that. Um, I, told, I, I told my work that I was going to switch to part-time uni so that I could spend more yeah. time at work. 
Instead, yeah. I was still doing, so I actually was doing five subjects a semester instead of four. Yeah. So I was still overloading. Yeah. Um, and what I would do, so the good thing about UTS was quite quite flexible. So I, I didn't um, attend all of my classes, but I, I tried to shift as many of them to the nights as possible. Sure. And yeah. um, and then a lot of the times, you know, I was I was training martial arts back then. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I had to go to take one day a week. So I used to, after I finished uni, I used to actually have nightmares that I'd have an exam or something that day, wake <laughs> up and, and be like, oh, shit, I'm not ready. And then, yeah. you know, it would only be after, like, I'd look at my certificate hanging on the wall and I'd be like, oh, it's just a dream. But, like, this yeah. was a re- it was a recurring dream to me and it happened multiple times. Like, I'm, I don't know if you, if you ever had any of those sorts of feelings and reflections, but I, I, yeah. I definitely had those feelings. So. Yeah, no, it was, um, I can relate completely, completely to that because my, my goal was similar to you, try to get as many subjects done as quickly as possible so I could get out of uni, start earning income. But at yeah. the same time, that overload was like making me just scrape through. Um, like I, I I couldn't spend more time there. But at the same time, if I spent more time, I would have obviously got better grades. But by year two, I was just like, at the end of the day, everyone's just going to look at this piece of paper. No one's going to care if I got distinctions, high distinctions, or whatever mm-hmm. it is. I need to get this paper and get out of here. So yeah. um, <laughs> I was just like doing whatever I could like you said, I miss the tutorials. I just weigh up like the pros and cons and go, I need to work. Work takes priority over the tutorials, but I need to get to the lectures. So I need to, and I just try to make this jigsaw puzzle myself to work out exactly what I do and got through in the end. But yeah, it's, um, it's a tough, tough period, that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess, um... So when you finished uni, what, what what happened then? Did you then move into league more full time and went to the Roosters, or what happened? Yeah, so um, I was with the Roosters, and then um, the Gold Coast Titans ended up coming to the competition. Um, at a at that kind of like the end of my scholarship, they were it was said that they were going to be there within a year's time. So I figured my best bet, rather than trying to move to Sydney, which was way too expensive anyhow when looking at everything was to double down on the Gold Coast. Um, so I was coming to the, the end of my uni degree. The Titans had come into the competition. So I just said, let me play out a year with no professional contract. Let me just do my best um, and try and be seen by, by the Titans effectively. I um, was fortunate enough that year to have a really good year. Um, just by busting our ass and the team did really well that um, they took a few of us from the premiership team that was the Tweed Seagulls at that time into the Titan squad um, yep. when they came into the competition, which also formed my last year of university. So I still had to keep doing uni while I was trying to do professional full-time footy, which was yep. tough because I had now moved into the NRL ranks, but I was yep. still doing uni full-time Funny. subjects per, per semester. And I'd also just started working for body science because they had seen that I was coming to the end of my uni um, and I was in exercise science, but I was also in footy. They sponsored the Titans. I'd written some blogs for them. And they're like, oh, do you want to keep doing it? And I realized, like, I don't know where footy's going to go. I'm better off getting a secure job that I can at least fall back on than putting all my eggs in one basket. So did that, took the, took the job. Was doing roughly about 20 hours a week for them doing the footy doing the uni um eventually got to play some first grade but then i also realized whilst i was doing that for like two years in the top grade um i only got to play a few matches here and there um did my scaphoid did my knee did my shoulder um all within that period and i was like kind of just looking at it going i'm getting one game or two games every year then getting a serious injury Mm. it's right i'm not going to really make anything significant out of this um then when i did my knee the next time i just went look i'm gonna stop whilst i'm ahead i managed to play some games i'm better off now taking the network i've built taking the skills that i've learned and just focusing on a career because turning 26 um whilst it doesn't seem old 
to a lot of people now. I'm 35 now, so it feels like a lifetime ago. In 40 years, that's a lot of that's a lot of years on the clock. And if you haven't played by that stage, 100 games, and I played three, there's a very minute chance you're going to all of a sudden accelerate and become this like big superstar. So I just went, let's call it a day there. Focus back on work. Um, yep. Started working for body science full time. Did that for four or five years further. Um, full time was great, great experience, great company. Um, and then thought to myself, I'd like to try something myself on my own. And then from there, um, I started a cafe with um, Greg Bird and Josh Graham, um, some guys that I was playing footy with at the Titans. Yep. Um, yep. That went really well. And then just parlayed that and went, I've learned lessons from that and kept kept that rolling from there. Yeah. Okay. So um, with the body science thing, so what was your what was your role when you first started there? Um, my role was basically product development, um, product development manager. So any new product to design, develop, put together, rules, regulations, anything in that space, performance was basically my role. So bringing yeah. something from scratch to life, yeah. basically. Yeah. Okay. And so did you, did they give you like, obviously they would have helped you to, to get into that field or did you already have some of that experience from obviously what you studied at uni? Um, yeah, I had a bit of an experience. I'd always been super cu curious into how I could improve my performance um, because being footy, I realized there was just people that were naturally more gifted than me. So yeah. I was always looking for ways to level the playing field, be it recovery, sleep, um, neuro patterns, whatever it may be. And then supplements were a way that I thought if I can eat well and supplement well, I'll bridge that gap and body science with supplements that I was using. Um, and so I, I literally just wrote to them and said, um, I really love your supplements. Have you thought about doing X, Y, Z? Cause I'd done that at uni and they're like, Oh, what made you say that? And I was like, well, I read this um, research study on this and this and this. And they're like, well, wow, okay, um, we haven't, but it is a good idea. Would you like to chat further about it? So just went from there pretty much, yeah. Yeah, wow. Okay. It's always like me reaching out for the podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and then, uh, so you, you spent about four years there. Did your role uh, evolve over that time as well? Like, did they start throwing more things at you and... Yeah, yeah, I think I just started naturally becoming a jack of all trades, be it marketing and sales and obviously product development and commercials and um, warehouse stuff. And yeah, you, you just naturally like anything when you're in a company. Um, if you've got a few different skills, you start to go between mm -hmm. a few different roles and it becomes blended and go from there. Yeah, okay. So then what was the, what was the motivation for starting the cafe? Ah uh, man, it was literally, I was on the Gold Coast. I loved Melbourne. I used to go back to Melbourne and go, the cafe here are awesome. Um, but I was really wanting food that I thought would be optimal for performance. I was like, if I had a cafe, I would have this product and this product and this product. And I'd make sure I'd have smoothies and um, use all these healthy ingredients so people could go to a cafe, know what they're eating, feel good um, and all that type of stuff be it vegan or paleo or keto or all that different types of stuff way, way back when uh, it was nine years ago, I think I did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about that. Um, and so I went to Melbourne. I was like, I saw how they were done there as cafes. And I was like, no one's really doing this well on the Gold Coast. Um, I wonder whether I should do it. And then I kind of just wrote a business plan I really looked at the landscape of the market and went, I think I can, I think I can do this. If no one else is doing it, I may as well give it a go. And yep. then I figured um, also from my network have the right people that will bring eyeballs to it. So just basically said, let's give this a go. Yeah. Okay. And so then when you first um, started, I guess you, you would have had to obviously establish relationships with suppliers and things like that. Yep. How did you how did you go about doing that? Was that something that you already had in your in your network, or was this you, you had to basically try and learn all this from scratch? No, I think uh, my background in body science really just taught me that 
although it's um, a different industry, um, be it cafe versus sports nutrition, all the same principles still apply. Um, you, you build a supply chain, you look for the very best that are doing something in field, you reach out to them. Sometimes they're interested, sometimes they're not. Um, you work your way down a list, you make sure that you can look after staff extremely well, you make sure systems and processes are in place. And then if you can rinse and repeat that cycle and make something at the end of the day exciting enough for people to attract people to your brand or your message, as long as you're delivering a good consistent product, they'll want to come back because there aren't that many good consistent products out there. So I just took what I had learned from working and then applied it to another sector. Yeah. Okay. And then, so how did you branch out from there? So, the, you, you know, you had, you had the cafe. What was yep. the next, the next part? Yeah. So the cafe was great, but it actually became so great that it was getting all this attention and news. Um, but I, and people were like, oh, I wish I could come to the cafe, but I live in Perth or I wish I could um, come see, because we had like yoga upstairs and Pilates and then a kid's playground and all these different types of stuff. They're like, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do this. And, but it's unaccessible. And I was like, they're right. There's only so many people that can actually get here. I need yeah. to get products to them. So mm -hmm. I basically took really... Um, key hero products that we had within the cafe and turn them into commercial products, which was basically our vegan granola was very popular. Um, and then our vegan chocolate. So I turned them into commercial products, put them on a website, started distributing them to local stores. And that led to biscuit whole foods, um, being distributed everywhere, like around Australia and in a few places overseas. And then, randomly someone basically said um we would love these toppings on like a um a side bowl but a side bowls there were so many of them and then we kind of like oh we good to do something that was like a soft serve like a healthy soft serve we haven't seen something like that that's been done um and then i was like well what if we reverse engineered how normal soft serve is and make it into like a coconut one that was vegan and gluten free and dairy and stuff. And then we made Cocoa Whip, which was basically the first like vegan soft serve of its type. And then mm. so those biscuit whole foods and Cocoa Whip actually ended up becoming bigger than the cafe ever yeah. did to the point we needed our own warehouse and our own manufacturing facilities and all that type of stuff. So I yeah. basically got managers into the cafe and then I focused on the products side yeah. of um, the business and then did that for a fair while and then um effectively um had some business partners got to a point we weren't all seeing eye to eye on the cocoa whip and um biscuit old food so it was kind of the case of i said you take this uh you take cocoa whip i'll take biscuit old foods we'll sell the cafe and we'll all go our separate ways so i did yep. that um effectively that was um what that happened and then worked on a few other projects and concepts and went from there. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the one, one of the questions I had for you, you know, as you were talking through that was, you know, when you're going and setting up, um, you know, the, the products to go into the stores and bits and pieces, do you have any like um, sales stories that you want to share? You know, was there anything, a highlight for you in terms of something or a negotiation that went, you know, whatever, well, could have gone bad, could have gone good, but was there something that stands out from that perspective for you? Um, and I think there was like just a aspect of not really knowing where things could go. And then one day, um, we started getting, we were just a cafe that had some additional products and we got hit up by, um, Whole Foods in the States. Mm. And I was like, well, um, and this was right at the time Amazon was going to buy them and all this different types of stuff. And anyone that's ever been overseas knows Whole Foods is like the mecca of, health health food i could be yeah. making it into whole because you've done something right so they hit us up and um we basically got into their original store in um texas like their very first whole food store and i remember just thinking to myself that showed me the power of doing a product compared to like doing a service yeah. or yeah. or doing um 
trying to do a cafe or retail or hospitality that one product could make its way from a little cafe in Nobby's Beach from the Gold Coast all the way to Austin, Texas. Um, and they reached out to us over it. And then I was like, I need to focus more on products. At that stage, I realized that was where where my passion and heart lied that I think I could do could do some good space in that world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I always talk about this uh, when I try and explain, you know, how, how businesses work to any staff member or anybody that I'm coaching. Um, I always talk about like there's three layers, right? You've got like the employee layer, the management layer and the leadership layer. And yeah. I can, you know, for me, when, I, when I'm hearing your story about your career and, and how things have sort of progressed, I can, you can sort of see how you went from, you know, being an employee at, at Body Science to then moving into that management space at a cafe, um, yeah. you know, working on the systems and processes. How do we now, you know, get this business to operate to its full potential? And then realizing that, hey, for this business to scale, you know, we're going to need something else. Right, and that's when you started to think about this product space, and that's where that that you you moved into that leadership piece where you're going, okay, this is the vision that I want to try and um, in, in, yeah. um, implement, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I, uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting, you know, um, can, can we talk a little bit more about you know when it all sort of you know, the separation, um, you know. I, was that a hard discussion for you? You know, because uh, you know, I think a lot of people obviously get attached to things that they build, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, what was your emotion when 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 all that sort of started to unfold and people had different op opinions and directions in terms of where they wanted to go? Oh man, for me, I, I don't I don't let my emotions or ego be attached to any any type of business. Like the business is the business, and that's it's great. It's awesome that we built it to this, but if we're not in sync from an energy or positivity point of view, I'd rather it not be there. Um, mm. I'd rather, I'd rather you take it, I take it, whatever it is, but we can't, we can't be together in it. So for me, it was a very clean cut and dry thing that we're, we're not aligned within this business. So there's no, there's no further point if we own it 50, 50, um, yeah. trying trying to do this um, I, I think it's a big mistake people becoming so wrapped up in their business it becomes their identity um, mm. you're, you're you as a person your business isn't you and you're not your business they yeah. they function independently of each other sure they need you need to feed it and put passion and work on it hard but if you need to be identified as business plus your name or your name plus business i feel something's gone terribly wrong there i i, I don't regardless of whether that means you're a multi-billionaire or you've got no money i still i still don't think that's uh, a good way to be in in my opinion yeah yeah i always say that you know whether it's uh, even if it's not if it's business if it's martial arts or if it's a club um any yeah. of those sorts of things it's all about the people, you know, it's the people that breathe life into it. Uh, it's the people that bring the passion, the energy into it. It's not yeah. so much about the, the business as a name because the name is hollow. You know, the company is hollow. Um, it's all about what people put into it and, and get out of it from that perspective. And it's one of those things where, you know, I think a lot of people get, get, do get carried away with that. Um, and I, I've seen that, you know, from, from the martial arts side of things where people get carried away with a style, right? And that used to be before USC exploded onto the scene. Everybody was all about, oh, it's, you know, it's about this style and it was frowned upon to, to, to go and, you know, try other styles or uh, explore other methods of doing things. Um, yeah. But, you know, as we all know nowadays, like that is actually one of the most beneficial ways of doing things. And, yeah. um, you know, why do we see the, the caliber of mixed martial arts as it is, as it is today is because of that refinement process where people have... Yeah realize that, hey, I can't just get away of having good jits. I can't get away yeah. of just being a wrestler. I need to know how to put it all together. And yeah. it creates new problems, right? Like, um, so, yeah, yeah the, that, that sort of structure is like, you need, you need to have structure to have, the, have growth and development. But then yeah. if you're outgrowing that structure, it's become a cage. Yeah. Right? So yeah, um, I, I want to digress for one second. And I just want to talk about the, the diet side of things, because I know you're really into plant-based, right? Yep. Yeah. 
Yep. Yep. And and you mentioned before, obviously, you know, when with the with the cafe, you know, you wanted to have something where if people were into keto, if they're into, you know, paleo, whatever it was, you wanted to, wanted to have something for everyone. Um, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about, you know, um, your 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 journey in terms of getting to this position where you think plant based is the is the way to go? Like, did you try all the other ways or? Yeah, man. I, I mean, when I was playing footy, I was heavy, heavy meat eater. It was what was. I was told to do so I did it and I looked at it and I was like sure makes sense um and I I I kind of feel like everything like all things humans we go through evolutions and what may seem like the smart thing to do at one time later you look at it and go it's probably not the smartest thing to do at that time so I feel when I finished footy and I started looking at it and I was going I'm working really, really hard, like late nights, early mornings and all these different types of things. And I came at it from the point of like a health aspect. I was like, what are the foods I can eat that will make me feel my best and give me the most amount of endurance mentally and physically um, through what I'm going through? And I think everyone can attest to this. Um, the easiest way to think about it is when I would have like a really big steak, poultry, whatever it is, I would just fall asleep, like just cold. Mm. Like I'd have a hard day and I'd eat something and I'd like wake up and go, shit, like why am I so tired or feeling full or sluggish? And I was like, but then I'd have to keep working. Um, mm. Like I'd have to get back on whatever work I was doing and pay accounts and all that different types of stuff. And then I was like looking at it going, this is clearly due to me having to digest this meat because if I didn't eat meat, I wouldn't be tired. I would just keep powering through. So I went, okay, there must be something in this. Did some research. I looked at the amount of stress that goes on the body to process meat. And I was like, well, if I could use that energy more for my brain, my output, whatever it may be, that can only be a good thing. So I just cut it back. I was like, well, I, accomplish this night a whole lot more than I did that night. Let me try it for a week. Week became two, two became four. Then I kept looking and more and more research into it. And I was like, well, there's a lot in in this. Maybe this is the better path forward for where where I am. And then I just kept doing it. Um, the, the benefits from an environmental and agriculture and animals and everything like that was very much a secondary thing that just occurred that I started finding out more. Um, a lot of people assume that I did it from an animal rights activist type of thing. And whilst that's a bonus um, of not doing harm, it wasn't the actual reason how I ended yeah. up here. It was just a case of, for me, I was going, I need to be as optimal as possible and this is working for me. So I kept doing it. Um, yeah. It's been doing it ever since. Yeah. Did you, um, have you had blood work done? Like you, you've checked all your levels and bits and pieces. Yeah. Yep. And, and well, yeah, that was my, yeah. That was my first thing to do. Cause I was yep. just like, um, I need to actually know that this makes sense and works. Um, be it my white blood cell count, be it my testosterone, be it my hematocrit, be it all those different types of things. Cause I wanted to double check it. And man, I haven't been sick in, 10 years odd that I've been, been doing it. Um, my blood work, if anyone takes it, my doctors look at it each time and just go, um, this is abnormally high in all areas um, in terms of all those different types of things. So there's definitely um, no issue for that. But I'm also a person that really understands that everyone is different. I'm not saying that what I'm doing will work for everyone. Yeah, I just know it works for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think if more people tried it, they'd probably find it works well for them. Some people may not work well for them at all. So yeah. it's also the aspect I'm, I'm curious enough to test and try things. If I tried it and it didn't work for me, clearly I would stop. <laughs> like I would yeah. just, I would just go, wow, this isn't agreeing with me. I have yeah. to stop because I need to perform at my best. But yeah. if I'm, still doing it it's probably something in it yeah and so uh, do you uh, like you obviously you know taking supplements as well right yeah yeah i take supplements but at the same time the supplements i take are 
the supplements that you find with combat, um, yep. be it protein, post-training for the additional recovery, super green products, which is just more like nutritional health insurance um, yep. that life gets busy. I may not get all the serves of veggies that I'd like to in a day. So this is yep. just a top up to ensure that I, I meet that. Um, they're pretty much it. Like I don't actually really take take too much. I take yep. tain whilst I'm training. I take reload post training. I take the super greens from the guys that I work close with. Um, switch nutrition. Take their vitality. That's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's one of those things that it depends on the individual, right? And I think a lot of people they they want to pick on like a, a fad or a label and, and attach themselves to that thing that that's what's going to work, but you yeah. really got to experiment on yourself. You need to you need to see how you feel when you eat certain foods, and then make that decision for yourself. Was that better or worse? And then yeah. you know um, to have I guess some sort of science behind it. Actually, get some blood work done to go. Well, what yeah. does my blood work say? And and you know th those two things sort of in conjunction um, yeah. give you a, a, a bigger picture. I think the other you know element that I think is is so important to health is is obviously the sleep element. Um, yeah. I guess from your perspective, like. Uh, are you or oh, it's hard with kids but you know from that sleep perspective have you been prioritizing your sleep or how do you sort of work on getting uh, adequate rest i don't get enough i <laughs> i, I straight up, there's like a sacrifice i guess with everything in life and unfortunately my sacrifice has to be be sleep with the kids so i i, I do my training first thing of the morning be it 4 30 or 5 a.m um and that's the only way, like, I have to sacrifice that to be able to spend more time with my kids. So yeah. um, I figure if I'm going to give up something, I don't want to give up training. Um, yeah. I need to work, but I need to see my family. So sleep is the thing I'm going to have to sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. Um, fair enough. Hopefully, la hopefully later in life it's not the same, but for now I've just gone, that's what it is. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 All right. Let, let's switch gears a, a, a bit. Can we can we talk about kids and then we'll, we'll come back to obviously the other things that we're, that you're currently involved in. Um, yeah. What was so? I, okay, let, let's go back a step, one step before we talk about kids. Um, from a relationships perspective, so how, how did you and your wife meet? If you don't mind sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was still playing footy at the time, and at, back in the day, we used to have a there was a bar called Titanium Bar, which was where we used to go after matches for our functions. Um, I met her there um, and we we basically went on a date after that. We saw each other for a bit, fell out, fell out of contact for a while, um, randomly bumped into each other again. I'd been trying to reach out to her for a bit and then um, she was going through some stuff with an ex-partner that she wasn't quite ready at that first time that I'd met her, but um, by the next time, fortunately, about six months later, she told me that she was past all that type of stuff then and she was ready to try and um, go further with things. And then, yeah, we've been together since then. I was 21 back there. So we've um, we've been together 14, 14 years now. Yeah. And obviously, you know, every relationship has its uh, ups and downs. Was there anything that you guys uh, or that you think that you guys do, do that, helps to keep you guys on the same pathway and, and, and keep you guys glued together. Yeah, yeah, um, you're 100% right. Every every relationship does have its ups and downs. I think um, personally, I think having a level of gratitude in, in terms of knowing um, like you get you get to share your life with someone and get to um, have, a, have a bond that there's always going to be shitty things and things that I do that are super annoying and things that she does that may be annoying. But when you always weigh it up, um, I think it's it's pretty simple to see that in a time like this where people have lost loved ones and it, it hasn't been easy for a lot of people that when you take stock of what you do have um, and someone that's willing to stick by you through your good days, your bad days and everything else like that, that that goes a that goes a long way. Um, that I feel people give up too easily on things just because at the time it, it isn't working or gelling or something like that. Compared to just going, well, I, I chose this person for a reason. 
um, at some stage. May not be all rosy now, but there was a reason why we came together. So why not try and work with all the good that we have rather than trying to look at it, all the negative or all the things that may not be working perfectly? Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's one of those things that you you need to have like that uh, almost like a, a logical checklist that you can yeah. remind yourself of so that when you are going through those hard times, it's like, okay, let's let's remind ourselves of why we got into this relationship with this person in the first place. And, you know, once you start going through that checklist and you, it, it almost helps to reaffirm your decision, you know, you're not, yeah. you're not, you're not focusing on the exit. You're focusing on how do we now, um, you know, get the pathways to grow back together and, and try and get it back on the same um, journey, you know, yeah. um, because at the end of the day, like it's, it's reality. Passion is going to ebb and flow. You know, you're yeah. not going to be passionately in lust, you know, for yeah. your full relationship. And, and, and kids obviously throw a spanner in that, in that as well. Um, sure. So having, having those things where you can actually go back and reflect on and, and remember the reasons why, you know, one of the things that my wife and I try to do on, on our wedding anniversary is go back and just watch our, um, you know, our wedding video and, yeah. and try and share that with the kids as well, like just the, the short yeah. version. Um, just so yep. that we can, you know, be reminded of some of those times when, you know, it was just purely about us. Um, yeah. But I, um, you know, when when we when we had kids, it was a I I I still think it's a, it was a life changing moment. You know, I had a very emotional um, moment, obviously when my when my daughter was born. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've I'm being blessed with three kids, um, so I've got girl boy girl. Um, yeah. But I guess from your perspective, you know, what was what was the whole um childbirth experience like for you but going back one step um during the pregnancy uh i always found that it was a bit hard as a as a as a male to sort of really appreciate you know the the journey of pregnancy because it's not happening within our bodies so yeah. like i think for me the excitement factor didn't really kick in until we all were, we were, were at the finish line and the baby's about to come you know and um I still remember like when Ann said, oh, I had a little bit of spotting. I rushed home straight away from work. And yeah. then I was like waiting for like 24 hours <laughs> for yeah. it to all <laughs> kick off. How, how, what was, you know, I guess, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, and you're probably right. It, it was probably similar that it is hard to really get the same level of excitement that the wife has um, or your partner has because like you said, there's something growing in them that they're feeling every day. You're, you're sitting on the sidelines, kind of waiting for, for this moment to happen. With us, there was, um, it was a known date that it was gonna happen because they were basically saying they wanted her to come on at 38 weeks because baby was gonna be quite big and they didn't wanna put her at risk in any stage or anything like that. So, cause we had a date, like I, I was like, knew that date was gonna be there, but similar to you, every day that got closer it became like more of a real thing and then when it was actually that day i was like wow like this is actually happening and then similar that when it actually all occurred it was like a very surreal um moment to think that it actually had happened because you had just spent this like whole time in a waiting pattern without really knowing what life was going to be like yes knew that it was going to change but you didn't really have a full grasp of what that was going to be like. So uh, yeah. it was, um, yeah, it was great. It was um, definitely change, changes everyone for the better, I feel. So yeah, it was, um, it was really cool. Yeah. It's a perspective shifter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I still uh, remember, you know, those first couple of weeks, you know, with, with Cadence and my our firstborn and, you know, you're running on adrenaline. You know, you got no idea what you're doing. You know, um, uh, I, I still remember, you know, in the hospital, like I was trying my best to be a good, good husband, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm trying, I'm doing all the nappies and doing all those different pieces. And, and Anne actually got upset with me because she was like, I haven't changed a nappy yet, yeah. um, because I was doing everything. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. she probably regrets it because it's like, you know, it's like every time she'll be like, she'll give me our, our third, our, our third child, Eden, um, yeah. who's, she's going to be one year in, in at the end of December. And yeah. I always say, you know, um, she, she tries to sneak attack me because she'll be like, uh, can you change Eden? She gives me the baby yeah. and then it's like, oh, oh there's a poo. <laughs> <laughs> Comes out of nowhere. You got, you've, got, you've got two, right? Yeah, two boys. 
two boys. Yep. Yeah. And I guess yeah. you know, from from that perspective, as a as a as a father, um, nobody gives you a handbook when you know to, mm. to say you know this is how you be a parent and things like that. You know, what 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 were some of the resources that you um, looked at, or did you did you look into any books or do any reading about you know what's the best way to be a, a, a good dad or like I guess how how have you sort of um, worked out your parenting style? Man, I, I um, to be honest, I didn't really read anything. I I looked, I listened to some audio books. Um, I listened to some podcasts. I think the main the main thing for me was I just try to look at people that I admired, including my dad and um, other dads that may have been my friends or may have been someone I knew, because um, I was one out of my friends, the first people to have a kid. Um, so I'd look at any people I looked at that were like, I really like what they do as a parent um, and their demeanor and their manner about how they go about it. And we just try to imitate that um, was the best I could, I could think of doing. Um, I think when they're so young, when a baby, literally in their infancy, as, a, as the dad, there's a limit to what you can do because they're about feeding and sleeping and the wife or partner is generally taking care of, obviously, the feeding. You may, they may express and you may do a bit of the bottle, but you're very much put on the sideline for a period. Um, so for me, it was just really preparing for um, looking at what other people did really well and trying to take best bits out of everyone I could. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's let's go back to um, post the you know when everything sort of separated from Coco Whip and 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 the cafe, etc. Um, when how did then your involvement in the hype group and and combat how, how did how, when did that, that all start to come to fruition? Then? Yeah. So that was um. It kind of started at the very end of Cocoa Whip. So basically um, some of the things we were butting heads with within the company was marketing. And I was big in wanting to do a lot in marketing and um, some of the other guys were very much wanting to make the product different, make it cheaper to be able to do it on scale and quicker and all that type of stuff. But I had no interest in doing that. I just wanted to do the very best product. Sure, it would cost more but I wanted to be able to market it everywhere, which would obviously cost money as well. But I was yeah. like, we need, we need to start investing in a marketing team so we can get out a message out to more people. So Miles, my business partner in pretty much everything now um, was in marketing. He had a marketing agency and I had seen some of the stuff he had done. And when we got that call from Whole Foods, I was like, we need to get, our marketing message very clear and concise if we want to have some wins here. So I reached out to him and it was a case of he had heard of some of the stuff I had done. At the time he was doing stuff for body science in marketing. He's like, I remember seeing some of the stuff you had done when you were working here as a product development manager and a few things. And we got to chatting and I was like, man, I would love your help to um, shoot this content for Coca with and for some of the stuff I'm going to be doing with Biscuit Whole Foods. And within 24 hours, what would take other people months to do, he delivered it all literally within a day, like shot the content, edited the content, put it on all platforms, set up a campaign, put a strategy together, did all this stuff within like 24 hours. And I couldn't believe it. I was mm. like, man, you're amazing at this. Like I need to use you all the time. Um, but again, I had that push pull scenario with his business partners wanting to do this and me wanting to do that. And so I was just like, if I had a marketing team myself, I could go do all these really good things. But then I looked at it and I was like, I'd have to employ a designer, web developer, um, social media strategist, a digital strategist, and all that different types of stuff, people that I have to employ. And I remember chatting with Miles and I was like telling him about where I was stuck. And I was like, I'd love if I could just buy into what you have because you have what I'm looking for. It's just I need that within my own businesses here, be it Biscuit and the lots of Cocoa Whip and that stuff. And he's like, well, would you be interested in buying in? Um, and I said, oh, for sure. Like, it doesn't seem like you really need any help. And he's like, I've got all this stuff covered in terms of, 
the content, the social media, that side of stuff. But I really need help with the business side of stuff, the finances, the operations, the tax, the wages, and the the other side of business that everyone knows about. I was like, yeah. okay, man. I said, and like sales and business development. And then I was like, oh man, I can do that. If you yeah. just want to focus on that, I could do that easily. So within 48 hours, I was like, man, met his accountant. His accountant showed me everything. I was like, I'm in. Just tell me where to sign and how much I need to pay. Yeah. Um, and at that time, the company was called Athletic Agencies. And I said, first thing, I, I was bringing my businesses over. And I said, the first thing yeah. I'd love to do from a business standpoint is rebrand and call it Hype Group because I feel what you deliver is a level of hype to people's businesses um, to put them on another platform. And you love that idea. So we rebranded, changed it from athletic agencies to hype. Um, and then from there, we had this incubator to be able to develop and create businesses. Um, and so he like said to me, I've always wanted to look at improving my performance um, in jiu-jitsu and martial arts and all these different types of stuff. And he had a, he owned a gym at the same time called mm. Apex Training Academy. And I was like, oh man, well, you know, my background in supplements, you should take turmeric, you should take some MCT. You obviously need to increase your protein levels. Um, you need some electrolytes. Um, if you're going to use turmeric, use black pepper. What's your probiotic intake like? All these different types of stuff. He was like, man, I don't do any of this. And Miles being Miles, he goes super hard, be his birds out all the time. Um, and I was like, man, like, so I went and actually just started buying all these like individual supplements for him. Um, the turmerics, the probiotics, the proteins, the electrolytes and all that type of stuff and giving it to him. And he was doing it and felt really good on it. But he was like, man, I can't take this pill and that pill and this and this. Yeah. And then he's like, I just love if Yuki has put it all together and he's give it to me in one yeah. thing. And I said, man, that's an idea in itself. Um, yeah. And I said, and I was brand new to martial arts at this stage. I was white belt, hadn't really done any of it, but I started training with him because he owned the gym and he was coaching me. I was like, would other people want something specifically for martial arts? Like you, what you're going through is like, man, for sure. Mm. And so I was like, well, this is the product I would do. Um, what do you think? And there was reload protein, same, same, no different to the formula that you have there. And he was like, man, this is exactly what I would need. Um, how do we do it? And I was like, well, doing, making the products the easy part for me, it's how do we market it? What do we call it? What do we do with it? And all this, and then we think it back and forth and literally that's how combat was born. Um, and then from there we produced that. That product came out, um, did well, started getting more and more interest, sponsored Volks, who was our first athlete. Then from there, he um, that led to a whole lot of other things. And two and a half, three, probably three years now on, um, he's an owner in the business. And so is his coach Joe, me and Miles are still in the business. And yeah, we just um, doing our best with it. Yeah. So how, how did that relationship with Volk come out was that was that through you know a network things that you brought to get put to, together yeah, yeah. yeah Volks's manager at the time was also a fan of combat and introduced us to him um and yep. was working with us on a business level and said i think alex would really like this product um this was before he was top 15 or anything like this is when we're talking early on his Yep. second fight in the UFC type of thing. Yep. He, he was, I, I think he had just either stopped working in construction as a brickie or he was still doing it. So this, this was like his manager was just saying, this guy's going to be really good. No one knew who he was. I knew yep. who he was from football. I didn't even yep. know who he was from, from MMA. So... Yep. That's how that came about, and we just sponsored him ever since, and then he just went on that tear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's always a, a bonus, right? Like when from that yeah. perspective, <laughs> when yeah. things work out like that. Yep. Yeah. So then, from a, a business partnership standpoint, was it was it then a bit of a no brainer to, to to bring him and Joe in, or 
Was that something that yeah. they wanted or was that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just a case of um, Volts has really good management now um, yep. with Louis is um, his main manager and also one of the shareholders in the business as well. He has mm-hmm. identified as an opportunity. He, he has said, um, what would you guys think about this? And I was yep. like, man, I love Volts. Um, obviously for us, it's a no brainer. If, if he's interested in it and he's um, really be building his um, business and his brand outside of just fighting. Um, yeah. It made a lot of sense for him, performance, nutrition. Um, and he was like, yeah, I'm definitely keen. And we just took it from there. Yeah. 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 I think that's important for, for any athlete, right? At the end of the day, you've got a, a very limited career, um, yeah. especially in combat sports, because, you know, the high, there's a high risk of injury. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you might, you know, some injuries you can, you can come back from, but there might be some that might be career threatening, you know? Um, so having that opportunity to then build up something outside of that, just like you did, you know, thinking about, you know, from, from the NRL perspective, you know, I can't, I can't do this forever. I need to have something else that's, you know, such such an important piece. So then, um, from that perspective, how did, so what was the, the, the drive to then, uh, create Sprout and Sprout Organic? Oh, that, yeah, Sprout's definitely the easiest one being, being a drive for me. So I think um, I think combat. Miles has been a martial artist for fifteen odd years. So his um, his passion and drive really um, led on to me, where I started feeling his enthusiasm and wanted to help him deliver that. Whereas Sprout was, um, like I said, I became plant based, and I had Ellis, my first son, and it was very simple that I had looked at it and realised that dairy in particular was an um, optimal for performance um, for kids, be it zero to 80, whatever age you are. Um, I just knew from all the research I had done that be it skin issues, digestive issues, um, health issues, brain fog, whatever it may be, um, theory could contribute to not making my kids feel their best. So he was breastfed um up until he was one and then there was just a transition where i was just like oh it's going to be hard for him to stay on formula i'm sorry on breast milk from this point on i just mm-hmm. go and buy some formula I'll, in my head i used to go i always go buy plant-based organic formula still remember yeah. it like it was yesterday um it was like five and a half years ago and went to the store and i went to woolies then Coles, simply thinking yeah i'll find something there was nothing there, but then I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is a bit specialty. I'll I'll go to the health food store and pharmacy, and I went to ask the pharmacist. So I said, I just need a plant-based and organic formula. She looked at me weird. I was like, should be pretty common. In in my head, I was thinking, if I can go to any cafe, get any type of milk I wanted, whatever it may be, um, you name it, almond, soy, macadamia, coconut, oat, yeah. whatever it is. The milks exist. Why aren't we giving? And I would say the majority of people actually lean towards a lot of that milk now. Why wouldn't we do the same thing with leaning that towards our kids? Just for the same exact reasons. And then she was just like, "Oh, because um, it's just not what we do or what we think." I was like, "This is weird." So, well, I always find it on the internet. Went on the internet. Went. There's actually not a plant-based and organic infant formula. Like, yeah couldn't wrap my head around it to be honest and I was like how is there not one and if I'm if I was to try and do one right now what would I do so I went well I'd use this I'd use this I'd use this um reached out to my suppliers got all those raw ingredients looked at the food code and went I can make what this food code is saying for me to do out of these ingredients here why hasn't this been done um so I just did it effectively. I did, I did it at home, made it for Ellis. Um, he loved it. And I went, this is perfect. I just do this. I had no intention of it being this commercial thing that would eventually end up. And then he did it for a period. I eventually it was just like, this is actually exhausting, mixing all these different little containers that I had that I have to run in. And they were already all dosed that I just pulled together. But when I ran out, that meant I had to do the exact same thing again 
and some sort, you know what it's like when when that, yeah. that that age they can feed once and then ask for it again 15 minutes later so you could yes be running back and forth in the middle of the night at 2 a.m going this isn't sustainable fortunately he um started eating solid foods and i was like oh well got through that period didn't really think of it again because i was like i've had my child maybe it was just that period type of thing and then I found out I was going to have my second Kingston. And I was like, nah, I need to, I need to see this through. Like I'm having another kid for a reason. Like this is like something's pulling me back towards doing this. What would it actually take to do this on a commercial scale? And if I went through this, how many other hundreds or thousands or millions are thinking the exact same thing and don't have the ability to get a product? Mm. that's effectively where it came from yeah wow yeah, yeah. i think it's it's common there's a lot of um kids that can have issues with reflux and things from certain formulas yeah. so yeah. you know it's it's great to see that there is that option out there for parents like at the end of the day yeah. you know the parents have got to do their own research they've got to make their own decisions in terms of of, of what's yeah. right for, for them and their family but you know yeah. to, to not even have an alternative like as you were saying when you went through it um yeah i think that's a, a very challenging thing for parents yeah, definitely. Yeah, one hundred percent. All right. So then, from the in terms of the actual uh, combat training facility, yeah. um, was that just an amalgamation with with where um, Miles was training, or was, like did you guys? How did yeah. that come about? Yeah, so that came about. So we started the nutrition brand, and then um, basically um, he was working hard in hype, hard in apex. Um, but none of them were like working together. Um, mm. So I was very much seeing him because he was my coach effectively. So we'd train early morning because he was like, you got to train and I would only train in the morning because my kids. Yeah. So I would go train early. He would get me there, train me early. Then we'd go straight from there to the office and then we'd work at the office. And then he'd be like, all right, better leave here. I'm going to go back to coach at the gym at night so he was going like open the door we train at 5 a.m and then he'd get back there at 5 p.m and then coach to 8 p.m um so he was basically going from 4 30 every morning to 8 p.m fall asleep by 8 30 rinse and repeat over and over again and he was just like going burning out and i was just saying to him like man we've got this great nutrition brand why doesn't the nutrition brand help this gym the nutrition brand is um, obviously part of the combat world, we have the resources, yeah. we can get people in the vaults and other people to come in and help coach. But it was a small gym apex that he owned with um, two business partners that are now friends of mine and also business partners in the combat training center we have on the Gold Coast. Yeah. And so we were doing, kept going and going. And then one day it was a gymnastic facility four doors up in the complex opened up and was for lease. And I looked at it and it was a big open plan. And I just said to him, I said, man, look at what combat nutrition is doing and look at some of the people we had. Imagine if we could get our athletes to come train in a top class facility. What would that look mm -hmm. like? That'd be amazing. I said, why don't we do a combat training center? Um, this lease is going to finish in three months. That lease is available now. The landlord already has history with you here. Maybe we should bring that together. Um, and he was like, I think that could work. When I saw the landlord, told him our plan, drew him a business plan, showed him what we could do. And um, that was it. It was just, yeah. um, it, that was in October. Um, sorry, it was in September that we closed Apex or I helped Miles close Apex. We transferred the members from Apex to Combat Training Center. Made that obviously quite a large presence gym. New members came, the two merged together and then went forward as Combat Training Center from there. Yeah. So from that perspective, right, um, as, as you mentioned before, like Miles needed help from the business side of things. Um, with, I guess what I'm curious about was, has he spent some time to actually learn some of those things from you or by watching 
what you do or is he just more focused on he, he stays in on what he's focused on and you stay on the other side of it um no he, he's definitely learned and, and vice versa so have I like I I didn't know anything about a camera or content or Facebook return on ad spends and CPAs and all that type of stuff so um we've just learned from each other um yeah by no means is he ever going to be the expert that I am in my areas and fields and vice versa. I'll never be the expert that he's in. So we, um, we as work to each other's strengths and um, learn from each other where we can and yeah, keep going from there. Yeah. Okay. And I guess the only other thing I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious about was along the, the journey, you know, have there been any notable failures for you? Like, is it, was there a time where you sort of hit a roadblock or something and then you had to make an adjustment? Yeah, every day. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there, there, there's, yeah, every, every day there's huge, huge roadblocks. I don't think um, if, you, if you're really in this that you're not hitting roadblocks from supply ingredient shortages to staff to um, complete... Be completely being annihilated by um, even just raw ingredients no longer being available to um, competitors spreading bullshit about you to doesn't matter there's al there's always something it's um and that won't change it's it's mm. more about you're gonna take some shots but you just got to keep keep walking through them so um, yeah we're we're pretty resilient in in nature so I think um, We'll, we'll always find our way through stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I guess let's switch gears a bit. I, I just want to talk about um, your your experiences fighting in the cage because I know you yeah. did that um, fairly recently. Um, yeah. What was the, I guess, was, was there, what was the particular motivation for you to, to get that experience under your belt? Yeah, man. Um, as I said, I've always loved competing. I'd finished footy at 26. Um, by no means did I ever think I would compete in fighting in any aspect whatsoever. It was kind of a perfect storm of a lot of things where a friend of mine, um, Musa, he, he was a professional fighter, but he got locked down with COVID like we all did. We were kind of like, I guess, globally, one of the only places not to suffer from it, be it Queensland, Gold Coast, mm -hmm. Queensland, Southeast Queensland. Yeah. We were just going on life like nothing had changed whatsoever. So I was talking to him and I met him when I went over to Thailand for a holiday and I met him there and he was training and he was doing the professional fighting from Thailand based out of Tiger and flying to parts of China and fighting. When yeah. I was talking to him, I was just like, man, like I can't fight, I can't raise money. And he had a martial arts program called Sanka for Martial Arts which was basically helping underprivileged people in Africa learn martial arts and all these different types of things. And the way he was funding it was by fighting, giving part of his purse towards that. Yeah. <laughs> and I felt, felt shit that like he couldn't do what he was doing to be able to fund that. And he wasn't able to provide, get a livelihood or anything like that. And um, we had started sponsoring Eternal um, MMA and I was chatting with Cam. I think it was like, it was in January that I was chatting to him and he was like, oh, the March show is going to be on. We're going to have to mainly use fighters from this area, which is going to be hard because of COVID. Um, yeah. Melbourne was out. Sydney was effectively out. All these yeah. different types of things. And he was struggling with the card. And he was just like um, talking about a few things. And I was just like, for whatever reason, I was like, man, I have an opportunity here because he, I was looking after obviously combats, fighters and what was going on from there. And I was looking at the commissions structure that you would get for things in terms of selling tables and seats and all that mm. type of stuff. I kind of just looked at it and it's like, I didn't, I don't need the money, but I thought this could be an opportunity to help Musa keep things going. Cause he, he actually had a fight that was booked for March. It got mm. canceled due to COVID. And yep. I'm not a professional fighter, but I was like, I've been training a bit. I'm in fairly good shape at the moment. I didn't blow out over Christmas. Um, kind of worked out the numbers, what he was telling me that he would need to keep things going. I said, look, I called him up and said, man, 
what if I took a fight here? Because I know you can't fight. And we did something where we combined forces and we did like a combat Africa type of thing. And I got the resource, resources to make shirts, send them to you over there. I'll fight here. I'll take anything I'm money I can make and I'll give it to you. And we'll get over to Africa and keep doing the momentum of what you're doing. And he was like, man, I 100% would love that. So I gave Chemical and said, man, if you can find someone um, similar weight, um, I'll, I'll do it. And then he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll put Chemical in. And then call me back, or call Miles back actually. I think he called him back in about an hour. So I think I've got someone said, it's going to be at 84. Can Cell make that weight? Um, I naturally was a football player, so me fairly lean was like 97 98 that's when i was like real lean um yeah. and i was like 84 um and so i called up a mate that was um a dietitian christoph and i said is this possible like could i make this weight and he said go get me uh go get yourself a dexa scan send me the results and i'll be able to tell you um because i know you'll be disciplined and strict if i give you the right diet send it to him he said can make it. You'd have to start from now though. And this was like 10 weeks out. Um, yep. I was like, no problem then. So I said, if I can make it and you know, I can make it and you'll, you're confident that I can be strict to the diet. That's, that's the least of my concern. I can do that. Yep. So that was it. Um, kicked off from there. And then 10 weeks later, got in there. Um, really great experience. The eternal show is as good as you'll get in Australia. Um, yep very best cam and ben um the owners absolute legends do so much for the for the sport in australia don't get half the credit they should um because what they pump in from production marketing promotions mm -hmm. the link up now with the ufc fight pass the link up that they've now got with espn the platform they're giving everyone is just awesome so yeah I definitely, apart from the fact that we sponsored the show, regardless, I still think the show is the best and they do the very best job um, that anyone possibly could. And I got matched up with a great opponent. He's a really cool guy, Casino, um, really close fight, split decision. Um, I think he was a great person to go against. Um, occasionally stay in touch with him, um, sometimes see him, but couldn't couldn't speak high, more highly of the experience as a whole. I really enjoyed yeah. it. So yeah. yeah, that look. I think you know promoting as a business is is a tough business. And then you know you add in COVID, and you know um, you know some of the guys that I know uh, that that are fighters here um, that are pros to kickboxing and things like that. Like yeah. they they've had you know contracts and then contracts torn up because yeah. can't do the fight, can't move, can't go. Like it's yeah. so frustrating for them. And you know they're pros, right? Like that's that's how they're exactly. supposed to make their living. Um, exactly. So I I I don't envy those guys that you know, um, invest a lot of money into those promotions to try and have yeah. things happen. Like, and then yeah. you know the venue restrictions to come in and those sorts of things that then just throw yeah. all those plans out that we know it's a tough time to be in 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 the in the sport. But at the yeah. same time, you know, if we don't have those guys doing those things for for the sport, how do we grow up for the next generation? You know, how do we? get this next group of up and comers coming through to, to get their time in the cage and, and time in the fight to, to yeah. move on to the next um, level. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the, the other aspect of it um, from that perspective, I, I really enjoyed hearing about just when you were talking there is, is that, you know, having that respect with your opponent and, but also, you know, it's not, it's, it's all amicable. It's not like, you know, yeah. there's any bad blood or anything like that. I, I really no. think that that's what martial arts is about. Right? Yeah. No, definitely, man. I, I, I mean, I couldn't help but respect the fact that he he took took the fight and vice versa. For him to have even got there during that period of time um, says a lot about him. Um, mm. For me to get in there says a lot about me. Um, mm. So I, I, I can't see why he would have any ill will or bad blood to, yeah. to someone um, in, in that aspect that you shared something with. So yeah, yeah. definitely from my end. Yeah. 
Well, one of the things that I think that I've really taken away from this conversation, I, I feel like you have like this unwavering self-belief in yourself and not in a bad way, right? Like I, I don't mean that like it's an ego thing. I, I mean that you, 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 su you support yourself with a good network of people. Um, you have a good, great network around you that instill this confidence in you to just be like, yep, okay, I can do this. I can do that, yeah. you know? And I, I think that's great. Yeah. No, thanks, man. I mean, I, I kind of probably the best skill set I've in I've found myself is that I am able to surround myself with people that are much better than me in in all aspects but being able to let them do what they do well and me do the few things that I do well try to do them to my best ability I think it's the easiest way to to get further further together um and when you remove the egos away from things at the end of the day everyone's just trying to do their best so mm. if you if you can find a good tribe of people that can all work together that no one's trying to one-up each other or anything like that we're just all striving towards a common goal you're gonna you're gonna probably go pretty far um just just in the aspect of you're working towards something special in in the end Mm, absolutely absolutely all right well um you know unless you've got any questions for me uh, I, I think that's uh, a great way to end this no awesome man i appreciate appreciate the chat all right i appreciate you coming on thanks for that no thanks